to you, who is who is Jesus Christ to you? Uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, um, and that He um, is the Savior for mankind. Anybody who was born on the earth or will be born. Who is Jesus? Uh, well, I think it's a pretty cool dude. JC. Um, I guess I believe in an, an all-knowing energy. Um, I was raised with, you know, the Jesus Christ kind of teachings. So I, I think of him as kind of like that all-knowing energy. For me, I think it's just like a role model for, um, I don't know, your values or, I don't know, your beliefs, your own beliefs. I think you can make it into whatever you want it to do. Like, if you want to do good deeds, you just say, oh, okay, I'm Jesus Christ. Think of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? God. Son of, son of God and uh, God and son of man. He was a healer and an all-around pretty cool guy. Um, I'm, I'm understating, obviously. I, mean. I almost think, this is going to sound bad, but it's like an excuse to have someone to believe in. He's a prophet, I mean, among other prophets, you know. He's not the last one, for sure. <laughs> Love to have a beer with him. He's a son of God and a role model. I don't know if there's ever been like a person named Jesus Christ, if that's like a real thing. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Savior. I think he was a, a figure of wonderful power and um, peace. Peace. And that's why I have trouble with the Crusades. He's someone very special to me. Like, I'll turn to him whenever. He's the one that I know will always be there when I have no one else to turn to. So. Well, good morning and welcome again to Stonebridge Church. My name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here. And as we prepare to look at God's Word, uh, the ushers are going to come forward in just a moment to collect the offering. If you call Stonebridge home and you want to support the Lord's work financially, this is an opportunity to do that. It's also an opportunity if you've got one of the cards in front of you and you'd like to let us know you're here or learn more about the church. Uh, so, Join me in prayer, and then uh, the ushers will come forward, and we'll look together at God's Word. Gracious Father, what a gift to gather in your name to worship you. And Lord, as we think about all that we enjoy in this world, we recognize that every, everything is a gift from your hand, that whatever we give back to you is simply giving to you what already belongs to you, what already came from your hand. So as we do that, may we do it with a heart of worship, Lord, uh, not with um, shame, not with a, a desire to manipulate anything from you, not out of compulsion or obligation, but out of joy that Christ is our greatest treasure. And so we ask that you would be worship this morning in our giving. We ask that you would be worshiped as we look into your word, that we would hear your voice, that you would prepare our hearts to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, or one of the prophets, and still others whom a couple of students and I interviewed on the Boston Common a few years back answered, a healer, an all-knowing energy, a role model, a pretty cool dude, a prophet, but not the last one, whatever you want him to be an excuse to have someone to believe in, a figure of power and peace, someone who will always be there for me, the Son of God and Savior of, for mankind. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? How do you define Jesus? 
That's the question we're after this summer in our series through the Gospel of Mark, defining Jesus. And there are a lot of different opinions out there. But our goal is not to wade through all of the opinions. Our goal is to go to the source, to Scripture, to see who does God say that Jesus is? Who has Jesus revealed himself to be in history in accordance with God's word? And our passage this morning forces us to encounter one of the most significant realities of Jesus' identity, of who he is. The fact that he's not just a great man, not just a great teacher or a great prophet or a pretty cool dude. He is God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh, the eternal Son of God, come down to establish his kingdom and deal with our sin. Now, if you've grown up in the church, that's not exactly a news flash, right? Uh, you know this. You've been taught since you were little that there's one God and three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that Jesus, the Son, is both true God, true man, fully human, fully divine at the same time. And though it might give you a headache to try and think about that too long, how all of that works, it's not exactly an earth-shattering announcement for some of us. And yet, if the idea that Jesus is God doesn't rock our world, if that doesn't cause us to stop in our, in our steps and ponder and be amazed, then I suggest we haven't actually thought about it carefully enough. And we're not talking about solving the mystery of the Trinity or, or, or unraveling Jesus' dual nature. I'm talking about coming to grips with the fact that the man we encounter in scriptures, the one we call King and Savior, the one we are, are devoting to following with our whole lives, that that man is no mere man. He is God in the flesh. More to be feared than anything we might dread in this world and more to be trusted than anything we might be tempted to cling to. In fact, coming to grips with Jesus' divine identity, the fact that he's God in the flesh, always elicits a response of either fear or faith. When, when we take on board the fact that, that who he is is God in the flesh, those are the only two responses you're going to see. Either fear or or faith. And in fact, that's what we see in the end of chapter 4 and in chapter 5 in the passage we're looking at this morning as Mark tells the story of several different people who come face to face with Jesus in his divinity and respond with either fear, the disciples, who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? Or, or the demons in chapter 5, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of God Most High? It's a response of fear. Or with faith, the woman with the flow of, bo- uh, of blood. Daughter, your faith has made you well, Jesus says. Or Jairus, the synagogue leader, do not fear, only believe. And what I want to do with our time this morning is... Look at the last story in chapter 4, the first story in this series, of, uh, in this collection in chapters 4 and 5, and, and spend our time focused on that. So if you have a Bible uh, with you, or if you want to use the one in the seat back or, or the underneath the seat in front of you, I encourage you to find your Bibles, and as you get to chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, go ahead and stand with me, and we're going to read God's Word together as we look at this passage. Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, with, took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke 
and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is God's word. You may be seated. So the story starts with a great storm. Verses 35 to 38. As we saw last week, most of chapter 4 was focused on Jesus' teaching, particularly his parables, as he's teaching the crowds uh, around the Sea of Galilee uh, in, from a boat along the shore. The crowds on the shore, Jesus is out in the boat, lest he be crushed by the crowd. And as verse 35 brings us to the end of the day, the scene kind of zooms in onto just Jesus and his disciples, his small band of followers who, whom he's been training and leading and teaching and investing in. And, and as they prepare to kind of move on for the day, rather than push through the crowd and try and make their way through, they just lift anchor and set sail, take off right there into the sea. But the Sea of Galilee even to this day, is known for its sudden, violent squalls. Uh, one author explains how the sea lies nearly 700 feet below sea level. It's in a, in a basin surrounded by hills and mountains that are especially precipitous on the east side. And then 30 miles to the northeast is Mount Hermon, which rises to 92 feet above sea level. And so if you can picture this, picture like the weatherman screen behind me right now, the interchange between the cold upper air from Mount Hermon comes down, and when that meets the warm air rising off of the sea, that's what creates these sudden violent storms that the sea has become famous for. And that's exactly what happens uh, in our story. Verse 37, a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Now, I have never been on a boat during a violent storm. I don't feel that that's something I need in my life for it to be complete. I'm okay imagining that. I've seen deadliest catch and what that looks like, you know, when the, when the waves come over the side and almost sweep the guy off. It's a terrifying experience. And so the disciples are understandably afraid. They're, they're understandably afraid watching the boat flooding with water so suddenly and, and feeling so helpless to do anything about it. But perhaps the most surprising part of this story is what we read in verse 38. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Jesus was taking a nap with a pillow. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? I mean, that doesn't make sense on so many levels. First, how can you sleep during a terrible storm like that? I mean, I think we had three thunderstorms this last week. Every single one of them woke me up. Uh, so how, but then mainly why? Why sleep through such a terrible storm, one that really threatens the lives of everyone who's on the sea? And, and his disciples seem to be asking the same question. Why, why aren't you Awake, helping us bail out this boat. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Why don't you grab a bucket like the rest of us and help us get to work? It's really surprising to see Jesus act this way. But Jesus often surprises us, doesn't he? Especially when we think we have him figured out when our definition of who he is turns out to be too small and he has to break our categories to reveal to us who he really is why take a nap during one of the most traumatic experiences of your close friends lives one in which they're pretty sure they're about to die i mean the word they use do you not care that we are perishing? That's a strong word. That's the same word you see in John 3, 16. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. They're, they're pretty convinced this is it. And so what does Jesus' sleeping communicate to them? What, I mean, what would he think? 
that he, his actions would communicate. It comes off like a calloused indifference. That's what the disciples are picking up. That's what the sailors uh, thought of, of Jonah in a similar story when a similar thing happened on the Mediterranean Sea about 700 years earlier. Uh, it's interesting how many parallels there are between the story of Jonah and what happens in our scene here on the Sea of Galilee. You've got a violent storm, you've got a crew that freaks out, and you've got a sleeping prophet. But there are also some important differences. Jonah was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Jesus is the presence of the Lord. And he sleeps with complete trust in his Father. For the storm to stop, the crew had to throw Jonah overboard. For this storm to stop, Jesus needs only say the word. And that's what he wants his disciples to realize. That's what they don't get. That the one who's with them is no mere prophet. He is no mere man. He is God in the flesh. And so Jesus' nap, which feels kind of like an insult, this, this cold indifference, in reality, it's an expression of his love. It is a chance for his followers to draw them deeper into the reality of who he is, how God defines him, who he truly is. He leaves them in their trial for a moment until they're ready to see Jesus as he is. And look at how the story unfolds. Verses 39 to 40, the great storm gives way to a great calm. First, Jesus says something to the sea. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still, zip it. That's what we say. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. At the mere word of Jesus, a great storm was replaced by a great calm. And then he says something to his disciples. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? The disciples who have spent every waking hour with Jesus should have known better than to freak out. So there's something not clicking something not clicking for them. They're not believing Jesus to be who he really is. That's the problem Jesus identifies. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Their definition of Jesus is too small. It's too small. And so in verse 41, the great calm gives way to a great fear. You thought they were afraid before. Look at what the disciples say to each other in verse 41. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They don't understand who Jesus is. And so therefore they're shocked. They are terrified at the power that they just witnessed. They thought Jesus was a lot smaller than he really is. And so the great storm that was replaced by the great calm is now overtaken by a great fear. They fear Jesus. They're overwhelmed with both awe and terror that their teacher, their rabbi, has authority and power to tell the sea and the storm what to do. And if you think for a minute about what they're taking on board in this moment... There's only one person in Israel's faith, according to Israel's scripture, the Old Testament, there's only one person who has power and authority to command the sea, and it's not Aquaman. And, and the sea that, that was so often a metaphor for evil and chaos for Israel, only one voice could calm it or control it. It's the same voice that created it. Only the voice of God. And you look at Psalm 107. God, speaking of God here, He made the storm be still. The waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and He brought them to their desired 
haven. Or, or Psalm 65, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, who stills the roaring seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. Only God himself has authority and power to do what Jesus did in that boat. And there's only, therefore, one conclusion you can draw. Jesus is God in the flesh. That's what hits them. And when they witness that, they react in the only appropriate way. They stand in awe at his signs, as Psalm 65 puts it. They become more afraid of their teacher than they were of the storm that almost just killed them. Who then is this? Who really is this that even the wind and sea obey him? They fear a great fear. But Jesus' goal for them is not fear. Uh, Reverence, humility, yes, that's what we mean by fear or the recognition that God is God and I am not, the fear of the Lord, yes, yeah. But his goal for them is not to be afraid. That's what he asked them. Why are you afraid? His goal is for them to believe, to have faith. Have you still no faith? He wants them to believe that if they have him, they don't have to fear the storm that the one who is with them is greater than any storm. They need only trust Him because He is God in the flesh. He's calling them to faith. They didn't get it. They didn't understand who Jesus is, despite all the time they spent with Him. And so, Jesus, rather than being frustrated, Jesus, in His love, makes space for them to come to that realization he takes a nap. He takes a nap. He was unwilling to leave them where they were in their unbelief, and so he leaves them in the storm for a bit until they're ready to wake up to the reality of who he is. He disrupts their world so that they might have faith. His curious little nap was in reality an invitation to a great faith. And he often loves us in a similar way. Because we too, regardless of how much time we spend around Jesus, can so easily forget or fail to realize that he's no mere teacher. He's, he's not just my buddy. Like the people in their interview, we make him into whoever we want him to be. Or, or like the disciples in our story, we get so focused on the terrifying circumstances around us that we miss the presence of the Creator with us. I don't want to turn this story into a mere allegory, but it's not hard to see how we react in exactly the same way as the disciples here. We think God is asleep. How else do we explain when our world falls apart? Maybe we're drowning in bills or we're drifting relationally from our spouse or from our kids. Our mortgage is underwater. Our business capsizes. Our our bodies are racked by wave after wave of sickness and disease, and as soon as you feel like you're about to find your feet, you get hit with the next wave. We feel suffocated by depression. We can barely keep our nose above water, and we wonder why Jesus can't just wake up grab a bucket and help us start bailing. Where is he? But what if we're asking him for too little? What if we're asking him for too little? What if we're treating him as too small? What if he loves us too much to leave us in our small faith, our unbelief, and so he's leaving us in our trouble in our trial, in order to create space for our little faith to be exposed and expanded. 
preparing us to pay attention for when he does something only God can do. Remember about 15 years ago when Carissa and I moved to Wheaton for grad school, um, after a few months we pretty much ran out of money. We had some savings for the first few months and then for a number of reasons the job I had lined up had not yet produced a paycheck. And so we found ourselves uh, with a deadline and simply no money to pay the rent. And I remember telling her one night, we need to pray for a miracle. We need $1,000 tomorrow or we cannot write this check. The next day, we found a card in our mail. Some of our friends back in Nebraska, uh, people we had led in Bible study and been part of the the navigator ministry we were involved with, they'd been hanging out. It was kind of you know, spending time with each other, and, and uh, each of them, quite independent of the other, kind of felt this desire they needed to pray for us. They wanted to pray for us, and so they stopped what they were doing, hanging out, and they just spent some time praying for us. This was earlier in the week, and through that prayer, several of them felt led to give something to us with no knowledge of our situation, and so they took up a collection among them, among themselves, bought a card, signed it, mailed a check, that a check for $990 that arrived in the mail with this explanation the day that we needed it. We think God is asleep. We think God is asleep and our world's falling apart. And then Jesus does something that only God can do as if to say to us, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? None of this should trivialize the very real pain that some of us are experiencing even right now or or will one day go through. And none of this should minimize uh, the understandable fear we experience when our world falls apart and closes in and we can't see the way forward. But it should remind us. In fact, it must remind us that there is more to our story than our circumstances that the persistence of our troubles is not evidence of God's indifference or impotence, impotence, his powerlessness. It's not necessarily evidence of that. In fact, it may be evidence of his love as he graciously and patiently makes space for us to come to the realization that he's no mere man, he's no mere prophet, he is God in the flesh to, re- to expose our little faith and replace it with confidence and trust in Him. The God who spoke this world into being, the God who commands the destiny of every living soul, that God came down to become like us, to be with us, to be our King, to be our Savior, to be our friend. That is who Jesus is. If you have him, you do not have to be afraid. You don't. If you have him, he is bigger than any storm. You need only trust because he is God in the flesh. Following Christ is an act of faith. It's an act of faith. It is taking him at his word it is denying ourselves taking up our cross it's putting the full weight of our hope and our joy in christ alone going all in with jesus such that if this doesn't work out if if this somehow proves not to be true then i've got nothing because i put it all on jesus that's faith and this morning we get to celebrate that faith in the lives of several people who have trusted Jesus and are bearing witness to the saving work of God in their lives through the ordinance of baptism. We had two in the first service and uh, one, I believe, in this service. And if you are getting baptized, this is a good time for you to go and, and get ready for that. Baptism was commanded by Jesus, our Lord, and it serves as a mark of our union with Christ in His life 
his death, his burial, his resurrection, and therefore also a mark of our communion with the body of Christ, with the new covenant people of God. Baptism declares to us the gospel that we who were by nature rebels and sinners have been reconciled to God and included in God's people, not because of who we are or anything that we've done, but by God's faith, by God's grace through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of His Son. And so baptism is a testimony of faith, yes, but it's also a testimony of God's work in our lives, what God has done. As Paul says in Colossians 2, we've been buried with Christ in baptism. That's the, the picture of going down into the water, dying to self, dying to this world, uh, dying to sin, being buried with Christ, and then in which we also were raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. That's the picture of then coming up out of the water uh, as a sign of new life. And so baptism really marks a turning point. It marks a turning point for us where by God's grace and by the strength of His Spirit, we commit to following Him with our whole lives. All in. That's the message of these t-shirts. That's what it's talking about. Uh, Paul says this in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Are we, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's this new turning point. And so as we celebrate that, as we celebrate these new lives, as we commit uh, these brothers and sisters to the Lord this morning as they put their faith into practice in following Jesus. I want to pray for them and dedicate this service, this celebration and ceremony to the Lord. So please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the one who spoke this world into being, who commands the destiny of every living soul whose Son came down to be with us, who accomplished redemption for us through the cross and resurrection. If we have you, Lord, we need not fear the storm. So may we be people of faith and may we grow in that faith. And we rejoice this morning as we present to you those servants who have believed in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and who have repented of and renounced their sin and now stand ready to follow Christ in all He commands. Lord, as they follow You today into the watery grave of baptism, may they rise to walk in newness of life, clothed with the full armor of God, filled to overflowing with joy in Your Spirit, and ready to follow You wherever You may lead. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Cody Pritchard, uh, and this is my wife, Tracy. And um, yeah, we're being baptized today. <laughs> so uh, for me, um, I definitely grew up in the church, uh, and it felt like I always uh, knew right from wrong, um, grew up in the Word. But uh, for a long time, especially through college and, and several years after, I definitely just lived for myself um, and not for the Lord, always putting on a show, feeling like, yeah, I knew what was right from wrong, but turning to God when it was convenient to me. Um, but um, I'm being baptized today because uh, I made the decision that it's not for me, but it's for him and everything that I do. Um, and I want to glorify him in my baptism, but also in my life every day moving forward. Hi, everyone. This is Tracy. I also was raised in the church. Um, I was raised in a Lutheran household and did what I thought was right all the time. It was vacation Bible school and teaching Sunday school and went to church twice a week. Um, and it really wasn't until I got older that I realized for me, Christianity and church and Jesus was a checkbox and it was a to-do list and I thought I was doing it right. Um, it really wasn't until one man asked me, do you know Jesus? And I said, of course I do. And he said, no, but does he know you and do you actually know him? And it blew my mind. 
um, and it kind of opened this whole new journey for me um, in realizing that it's not just a checkbox, it's about knowing and having a relationship with Christ. And I'm so excited to be baptized today to recommit myself to living my life for Christ and for being a part of this community and being a part of a world in which He is who I'm living for and continuing my walk with Him. Hello, I'm Brown Montag. I've been attending Stonebridge Church since summer of 2016. I've been married for 17 wonderful years to my wife, Valerie. I have two beautiful children, Shelby and Peyton. I think it's important for me to let people know that I've identified with Christ so that they can see with my faith story, my testimony, um, the changes that Christ has done for, uh, for me and how I've grown and matured uh, not only through him, but obviously through life and through relationships, especially with my wife and my children um, and adulting, because adulting is hard at times, especially financially, um, trying to be the head of a household or trying to be a father or trying to be a parent or trying to just have all of the answers uh, to life and to fix life's problems. And, and, more, and most of the time, there wasn't any answers. You just kind of dealt with it and you rolled with the punches. But with having Christ in my life, it seems that you always have your mentor by your side and you can always learn from every experience as opposed to just dealing with the experience. What baptism means to me and why I want to share it openly is Christ has done amazing things in my life since I decided to give my life to him. And my public display of this is me sharing to the world all of the gifts and all of the treasures that he has bestowed upon me to make my life better in every way, shape, and form.